Welcome to the module on medical kits for rescue, expedition and disaster response. That could equally be medical kits for the wilderness environment, tactical environment, humanitarian operations. Whilst the equipment and quantities may differ, the process for deciding what to take is very similar across the board and will serve you well wherever you deploy. Deploying for the first time on rescue, expedition, disaster, humanitarian operations can be quite daunting, particularly coming from the urban environment, whether it be an urban ambulance service, an emergency room, critical care ward. The tendency is to think, I need this, I need that, I would take this, I would use that. The reality is very different. The equipment needs to be designed and scaled so it's specific to mission and is practical and feasible for each location we're going to work in. So where do we start? What equipment do we take? Which medications do you need? What quantities? How are you going to carry them? A bum bag, fanny pack, depending on which side of the Atlantic you're on, personal mountain medicine pouch, body arm with pouches attached to it through the mole system, Pelican cases, what size Pelican case? You know, there are a whole range of options on the market at the moment, and it really depends on your risk assessment. What do we need? So the word of the week, the word of the course, the word of rescue expedition disaster medicine is, it depends. It depends on a range of factors, some of which we can control, some of which we can identify, but we must do our best to plan to prepare for every eventuality and be able to respond to the unknown factors as and when Murphy's Law kicks in. But it depends. I can't give you a prescription right now of what you need to take on tactical operations, rescue, expedition, disaster operations, because every country is different. Every disaster is different. The epidemiology is different. The number of participants is different. The supply chain in country, the distance and time to definitive care is different. What we can do, and we will do in this presentation, is work through the process so that you're able to look at each operation and analyse the risks and the needs prior to deploying to make sure you've got the right equipment and the right quantities carried in the right manner. It depends. It depends on a range of factors, and these are some of the things we're going to consider when designing a medical kit for your specific role and operation. So we'll need to take into consideration and evaluate our role, geographical location, climate, activity, mode of transport, patient group, level of training, legal considerations, and the available facilities and medical support where you're traveling to. What is your role? Are you a healthcare professional joining an expedition as a another participant? Or are you being employed or volunteering as the expedition medic? Are you a healthcare professional integrated into a search and rescue team? deploying as part of a disaster response team? And are you a basic healthcare provider or an advanced level provider? What are the expectations of your employer? What are the expectations of the participants? And what's your role? Are you expected to perform emergency care, primary care, dental care, perhaps prolonged field care, and are you prepared for it? Are you current, competent, and confident in all of the things that you're expected to deliver out in the field? Bear in mind, it may be your first time operating away from home, delivering services in a different language, working with different cultures, working in a limited resource environment. Consider, are you responsible for your team members? for the participants, for the victims, or 
are you also responsible or expected to care for the indigenous population too? Tribes, people, porters, um, they all form part of the team or we're going to come into contact with them. Well, what is the expectation? Perhaps your risk assessment needs to be extended to consider the epidemiology and the cultural considerations for that particular group. Once you get the bug and you start to deploy as a medic, multi-purpose versatile medic in the rescue expedition disaster spheres, you might find yourself in the jungle, the Arctic, mountains, arid terrain, overland operations, in helicopters, trekking through the forest. Um, time and distance will change. The amount of participants will change. Your level of training and experience will change. The expectations will change. Uh, perhaps your scope of practice will change. It may need to change. Some skills and knowledge are interchangeable. There's crossover. There's definitely crossover between the rescue expedition, disaster, wilderness and tactical environments. Some skills and knowledge can carry over. Primary care, emergency care, patient assessment, airway management, planning. And certainly this exercise or this presentation is one of those things that definitely carries across and that is the ability to diligently and accurately risk assess the operation in advance and prepare your medical logistics so that they meet the demands of the role the environment and the likely risks that you could encounter so whether you're on an oil rig land or offshore based running a post-disaster medical mission supporting a tactical team or you're the, the lone medic on a high altitude expedition, the process remains the same. Your personal preparation, your personal equipment and training will need to be adapted for each geographical environment. Equally, the medical equipment and the medical emergency response plan will change from environment to environment. It's not the same deploying to a hostile arid environment as it is to deploying to the Arctic, a high mountain environment or doing an overland trek or an overland um, vehicle trip across the Mongolian desert. Heat, cold, altitude, flora, fauna, they all play a role in adding significant hazards and potential risk to your group and it needs to be planned for. So what are the risks? Often we jump to conclusions immediately. Ah, road traffic accidents, gunshot wounds, malaria. Maybe, maybe. But perhaps the reality is not as obvious as we might think. This is an excellent paper published in 2010 in the Wilderness and Environmental Medicine Journal, entitled Expedition Medicine, the Risk of Illness and Injury. And it looked at hundreds of expeditions over a period of time across the globe, including Africa, Asia, Latin America, uh, and it publishes the statistics for illness and injury on those expeditions. And it's quite interesting. We can see from the table on this slide that during 120 trips trekking at low altitude or less than 4,000 meters across the Americas, Africa and Asia, the most common medical incident was gastrointestinal upset. Not acute mountain sickness, road traffic accidents, malaria, gastrointestinal upset, closely followed by isolated soft tissue injuries and foot complaints. Maybe athlete's foot, blisters, um, subungal hematomas. So this is a, an excellent document because it allows us to see what the specific risks are in those environments based on those specific activities. 
and we can plan accordingly. We now know we probably need to take gastrointestinal medications and elastic bandages versus anti-venom and tourniquets. As part of the planning process, we need to identify the hazards and the risks which can affect our group. Researching the topics, looking at past published papers, statistics, communicating with in-country organisations, embassies, humanitarian organisations who can potentially contribute information and data to help with our risk assessment. But at base level, in a nutshell, irrespective of the information available or where we're going, we need to consider the risks associated with three specific spheres. The risks associated to the people who are going to be on the expedition or involved in the rescue or the disaster. Do they have pre-existing conditions? How old are they? Are we expected to care for an adolescent population, geriatric, paediatric, or a broad spectrum of age ranges? Is there a specific gender we're likely to be taken care of? Is it an all male group? Is it a mixed group? What is their level of education in terms of caring for themselves in that specific environment, on that specific activity? Have they got specific training experience to help mitigate the risks? What are the cultural culture and considerations? It may be based on the culture of the participants or the indigenous population or the affected population that we need to adapt our approach to care, to communication, to breaking down barriers and perhaps even adapt our treatment. And what is their physical capability? All of these things can reduce or compound and increase the risk to us and the participants and therefore change our approach to risk mitigation, change the supplies and the equipment that we need and, uh, and the quantities. We need to analyse the environment. Are we heading to a hot or a cold environment? Is it humid or dry? What altitude will we be at? Are there any waterborne issues, whether it be stagnant pools which can attract vector-borne diseases or fast-flowing rivers that could contribute to drowning? Flora, fauna, the time and distance to definitive care or communications or transport links. And then look at the activity. It's very different trekking through the jungle compared to skiing in the Arctic or ice climbing at 4,000 metres. The activity will change the risk and therefore what could occur and the equipment that we need to manage it. So this slide is of the trick, 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 tricks, which gives us a score and a level for our risk analysis. The risk, the hazard is what can occur, or the hazard is the danger. And the risk or the risk level is the probability of that danger affecting our population, the probability versus the impact that it could cause or the seriousness of the consequences should that hazard or that danger come into contact with our population. So risk is probability times impact. You can see on probability, the table goes from one to five, uh, from highly unlikely all the way up to very likely or occurs frequently within this sphere. And then the impact goes from negligible minor illness or injury, all the way up to critical illness, death or permanent disability. If when we're analysing the risk, the likelihood of the probability and the impact give us a result that lands within the green, we're not too fussed. It's acceptable. If our risk rating is orange or red, medium or high, then we need to take a serious look at the activity we're doing, the procedures, the protocols, the training, the personal protective equipment. And we need to look at implementing additional risk control measures in order to reduce that level 
and reduce the risk or mitigate and control the risk to reduce the likelihood of it occurring within our team or reduce the impact if it does occur. So before going to the detail on this table, um, what we need to do ideally is take out uh, a board on the wall or a jotter or a notepad or sit around the table and brainstorm ideas, board blast the ideas, get as many ideas as possible onto the table from yourself, from a medical perspective, from participants who've never been to that environment before. So they come into the, the approach with an open mind and from people who have worked in that environment in the past and have got experience of that specific situation. Share the ideas, put all of the ideas on the table until they're exhausted and then put them in some sort of semblance of order by category. Let's categorize hazards by people, activity and environment. Once we've got all of the hazards identified, then we look at who can be hurt and how, who can be impacted by that hazard. Us, the team leader, the medic, the climbers, the rescue technicians, the indigenous population, displaced persons, who can be affected and how. Then we need to look at the next column, which is the risk rating. Based on the current situation, how likely is that population to be affected by the hazard? And what would be the consequences of that hazard coming into contact with our population? So probability times impact gives us our numerical risk rating. And then based on the color and the number, we decide, is it tolerable? Is it acceptable? We've got options. We can either accept it as being tolerable. We can terminate that activity, eliminate it completely from the program. We don't visit that area. We don't conduct this activity. We can treat it, which means applying risk control measures protective equipment, training, procedures to reduce the likelihood, or we can transfer the risk to a third party so that they conduct that exercise, whether it be we transfer through an insurance policy or we transfer the responsibility for uh, transporting the logistics to base camp, or we ask specialists to conduct the the extrication process or moving logistics across a river, we transfer it to a third party to reduce the likelihood of the hazard impacting on our group or our population. So depending on what we choose to do uh, will depend on if we proceed with the next column. If we need to conduct that activity, we want to continue, but it's still, the risk rating is still too high and we need to look at what are the risk control measures we can put in place to control the hazard to prevent our participants becoming victims or becoming hurt. So in this case, we've identified a few hazards. Under the people, we've identified a participant with pre-existing asthma that is triggered by cold, dry air and exercise. That's the hazard, asthma, through the exercise. Who can be hurt? The participant, triggered by the exercise or the cold air. Uh, the severe asthma attack could lead to respiratory distress and, uh, and death. So how can we control it? What risk control measures can we put in place? Well, we need to interview the participant. We need to interview the patient. But some things could include regular use of preventative inhalers, covering the mouth and nose with a balaclava or scarf to prevent the inhalation of cold, dry air, regulate the pace of the ascent, to avoid overexertion, which could be one of the triggers, and then carry an emergency albuterol, salbutamol inhaler. And then the next column, who is responsible for ensuring that those measures are implemented and are undertaken in a timely fashion? If it's not specific and it's not communicated and it's not checked, then participant A will think participant B is doing it. Participant B will think the team leader is executing the risk control measures. 
the team leader might think the team medic's doing it. And in the end, nobody does it. So we need to be very, very prescriptive in the risk register and say who and when is responsible for the implementation of the risk control measures. The next column then is the risk rating after implementing the risk control measures. What is the probability of that occurring and what would be the impact if we've minimized it through our RCMs? Hopefully, the number is lower than your first risk rating. Hopefully, it's still tolerable. Uh, and then we can carry on with that exercise. We continue to conduct that exercise or activity or daily routine. Some other examples then, trekking through the jungle, all participants could be the subject of heat illness, um, heat exhaustion, heat stroke, heat cramps. Traditional climbing, perhaps the lead faller could climb, causing head injuries, multi-system trauma, death. Um, so how can we mitigate that? How can we control that? We should screen the lead climber for their experience, conduct due diligence, ensure we're all singing off the same song, should we have common standards and common procedures, we talk the same language on the rock face, we use the same equipment. Pre-trip training to make sure that all participants are familiar with the, with the equipment that we're going to use. There may be slight differences in approaches in equipment, in the way we use the equipment. We should plan the route, conduct equipment checks, wear personal protective equipment from gloves and harnesses to helmets and goggles. Uh, and then who could implement that? The team leader can give the daily briefs, can check the equipment, the guides can get involved. So this is just a general example. Peak or Orizaba or any other extreme high altitude peak, climbers, participants could be subject uh, or could fall victim to acute mountain sickness, high altitude cerebral edema, high altitude pulmonary edema. Uh, and how can we mitigate that? It's a high risk, depending on the ascent profile, depending on how acclimatized the participants are or their past medical history or their past performance at altitude, although that's not necessarily an indicator of future performance. So risk control measures could include steady, gradual ascent profile, including a gradual increase in sleeping altitude, gradual acclim acclimatization treks, good hydration status, monitoring by the mountain guides, carriage of emergency medicines, a good communications plan and medical emergency response plan. Um, and the guides would be responsible for that, conducting daily checks of participants and getting feedback. So this is just an example of a risk register Yours, irrespective of the environment you're deploying to or the role you will be undertaking, you shall have a thoroughly completed risk assessment, having exhausted all of the ideas and all of the potential hazards and being very specific about the risk control measures and the responsibility. This is probably an exercise that you should do with the team leader. Uh, you should each have a copy of it. It is a live document. It will be subject to change as participants move in and out. Mission creep takes over. Weather changes. The tactical situation uh, may morph and develop. So it's a live document. Things will change uh, and you may accept risks. You may have to transfer them. You may have to highlight them to the team leader. The participants are saying, no, we need to terminate these risks. We can't travel to this area because we can't reduce the risk. We can't control the risk. This document will serve as a great planning tool to highlight what could go wrong, what you need to manage it, and what equipment supplies and medications you need to take to each environment. And it will change every time. It's also a great legal tool to prove that you were committed to controlling risk with as far as was reasonably practicable within that environment. Dent 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 identify the equipment that you need to control or respond in an emergency. How do you carry it? How do you carry it? On a belt pouch, ruck, 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 rucksack, in a hard pelly case, in a soft 
first aid pouch. Carry, 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 carry your equipment. How are you going to protect it? Consider several concepts prior to selecting the right carriage. The package is it hard, shell, soft shell? How do we carry it? Is it going to be hand carried? Is it going to be in our rucksack? Are we in a vehicle borne team? Are we going to be at base camp? Do we have access to porters and mules? Uh, how do we carry it? It needs to be comfortable. It needs to be practical. It needs to be accessible. Protection. Depending on where we're going, we need to consider protection from theft, protection from humidity, heat, cold, dust. And, and how practical is it? Carrying a pelican case in one hand up the side of a mountain is not practical. It's not comfortable and it's not safe. Um, you'd be far better off carrying two walking poles or an ice axe. Um, and if you were to slip and let go of the pelican case, aside from any potential damages, the case will probably hurtle down the side of the mountain, never to be seen again. So consider your consumables, diagnostic equipment and medications. How do you intend to carry them? Consider package, portage, protection and practicality. Here we've got some examples of robust pelican cases in operation. Small, lightweight, protecting communications devices, satellite Wi-Fi hubs, tablets, ultrasound, solar chargers, very delicate, fragile equipment that if they were to become damaged could be costly and limits your capability as a medic. So the Pelican case provides some protection from blunt force, droppage, um, provides protection from humidity, from water, from heat. Great piece of kit. Doesn't exactly mould well into the base of the rucksack, uh, but is an excellent piece of kit to slide in the boot of the vehicle or, or the trunk of the vehicle. We've got rucksacks, um, portable trekking, mountain leader, mountain leader pro, soft shell first aid kits, which might carry just enough for emergency first aid incidents. Nice and light white, multi-purpose, and just slide into a pouch or your rucksack. Then we've got larger containers full of medicines, which are not practical to carry, uh, but may be ideal for vehicle-borne operations, medical missions, or disaster response operations. So these photos just give you an idea of how the different uh, packages can be employed in different environments. You've got an idea of the packages that are available. How large do they fit in your rucksack? Do they fit in the trunk of the vehicle? If you are going to carry them, how heavy are they? Is that going to make you uncomfortable? Is it going to make you fatigued? affect your decision making, uh, your critical thinking, what's the mode of transport, how fragile are the items, what's the environment like. So consider all, the, the, all of these elements prior to going firm and deciding which package to carry all of your medical items. Deploying by boat, inflatable raft, wooden dugout canoe, helicopter, the Mark I boot, 4x4 four four vehicles, armoured vehicles, mules, yaks, however you intend to move around. Quick, 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 equipment should be secure to you or to the vehicle and it should be locked down so nobody else can gain access to it. Deploying overseas, you're likely to cross through international borders. Perhaps you're going to fly direct into Georgia, direct into Colombia, or maybe you will fly into one Middle Eastern country or, or Southeast Asian country and cross the border several times to get to your final destination or throughout your overland expedition. At the border, you need to consider your posture, the equipment, everything you've got is going to come under scrutiny. First of all, control drugs. As a UK healthcare professional, advanced life support paramedic, um, as an autonomous practitioner, you may be authorised to carry morphine. The UK government may even allow you to leave the UK with morphine. That doesn't necessarily mean that you will be able to enter Yemen, Mexico or Colombia 
with morphine. So you need to check ahead of time, check with the authorities in the country you're going to travel to if that medication is permitted at the border and throughout the rest of the country and what paperwork you need. Do it well in advance, ensure you've got the right paperwork and then consider, are you going to remain in that country or are you going to travel and cross several borders? If so, you need enough paperwork for each of the border crossing points. Aside from controlled drugs um, or moving into country with controlled drugs, you could consider to reduce the risk or reduce potential delays, even if they are legal, you could consider sourcing the medications in country. Uh, and we'll look at that a little bit later. Certainly on humanitarian and rescue operations, disaster operations, participants may travel with GPSs, tracking systems, satellite communications devices, perhaps even body armor. In the current global climate, we've got conflict going on in North Africa, the Middle East, even South America, um, several countries, Chile, Peru, Nicaragua, Ecuador, the social conflict erupting. These items at one stage would have been carried by humanitarian personnel, by media crews, uh, but also potentially carried by terrorists or military personnel. And therefore, irrespective of how innocent and how practical the items might be for you and your current mission, crossing through international borders with this equipment is likely to raise eyebrows. Um, you should have supporting documents to indicate what it is with serial numbers and descriptions and identify what your role is and be prepared to explain why you've got it, uh, but also be prepared to have it confiscated. I've had several GPSs and satellite telephones confiscated in Iraq, Jordan and Kurdistan. Um, so be prepared to have your equipment confiscated and do ensure during the planning process of your logistical plan, communications plan, the medical emergency response plan, that your plans don't hinge on one single point of failure and all of your plans collapse because the whole communication is based around the satellite telephone do have a plan B and C, do have a backup, tabletop exercise it, make sure it works, make sure it's robust, uh, but be prepared to lose things at borders with either paranoid or overzealous customs officials and particularly military personnel or police in the Middle East. Behaviour. In the current global environment of increased terrorist attacks across Europe and the Middle East, Southeast Asia, Spain, the US, Australia, border officials are extremely vigilant. Just like you wouldn't walk into an airport or board a plane and shout bomb, uh, you shouldn't walk through customs and discuss sensitive topics that might attract attention or cause suspicion. It's best to remain anonymous if you can't remain anonymous because you're a group of foreign medical personnel with a huge amount of baggage, then at least consider local customs and culture, maintain a low profile, keep nice and quiet, only speak when you're spoken to and have the right paperwork, documentation, credentials to be able to appropriately identify yourself and your mission task and why you need the equipment. Part of your re-trip -re planning process should consider a review of what's of entry. Can you buy supplies and medications in your, 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 your going to visit? Are they counterfeit? Are they legitimate? Are they safe? How much do they cost? Is the supply chain viable? Is there a regular supply? of good quality equipment and consumables? If the answer is yes, perhaps you can reduce the cost of baggage, you can reduce the size and weight of your packages, 
and you can purchase the equipment in country. That might reduce the paperwork exercise. It might reduce the amount of documentation that you need to prepare, prepare in advance. It might reduce any pot potential border delays. Um, but you need to confirm that the equipment and drugs are actually available and they are genuine and not counterfeit. Perhaps you can partner with a local emergency medical company, hospital, logistics supplier, or an international company who's well-established in the country, has a well-established supply chain, um, and you can partner with them or they can supply the equipment to you. But that needs to be agreed upon well in advance. Nothing should be left to chance. As the slide clearly shows, you can improvise almost anything with duct tape. From splints to crampon repairs to rucksack repairs to fabricating bowls, collection devices, drip stands. You can do almost anything with a roll of duct tape. The one thing you can't improvise is drugs. How do you improvise adrenaline, epinephrine during anaphylactic shock? You need to prepare for that well in advance. So when planning which drugs to take, you've considered your risk assessments, statistics, the epidemiology of the region and the population, uh, looked at previous mission reports or trip reports. Consider are the drugs multi-purpose? Aspirin, for example, anti-inflammatory, antipyretic, analgesic, and useful for myocardial infarction heart attack. Look at broad spectrum antibiotics. Rather than carrying five or six different antibiotics, carry two or three that will do various jobs. Are the meds you're taking legal in all of the countries you intend to visit? Have you got sufficient paperwork for each border crossing and the return trips? Is it more practical to carry an albuterol inhaler versus a large oxygen cylinder to nebulize albuterol? Are the drugs fit for purpose? Are they in line with your risk assessment? Have you got sufficient quantities to manage the likelihood of the risks occurring within your group and perhaps the indigenous population? Do we know how many people are expected to manage? Are your drugs protected from the heat, cold, humidity, direct sunlight? And are they secure? We would always secure our controlled drugs in a safe box inside the ambulance or the hospital. So what is the difference traveling overseas? We need to secure them wherever we're going, whether it be in the base camp, in the vehicles. So nobody's got access to the drugs, which could impede our operations and our ability to to care for our patients, or it could lead to harm. Based on the statistics, based on your board blast exercise and your risk register, what would you take? Which drugs would you take? Are you current, confident and competent in the use of all the drugs that you need to take? Have you got access to all the drugs that you need to take? What would you take for pain to manage GI infections, to treat or prevent acute mountain sickness, allergies, nausea, head, ears, eyes, nose, throat infections, diarrhea, dental pain, asthma, dehydration, fungal skin infections? What would you take? What are you current and competent with? Do you need additional training? Be prepared to respond to changing circumstances. Never truer was the phrase. We operate in dynamic environments. The number of patients can change. The weather can change. Destinations can change. Transport modes can change. Management of expectations. The photograph on the left, I was working as a, an onshore oil rig medic conducting health and safety audits, working the primary care clinic, and then responsible for the emergency ambulance with a full range of equipment. And then several weeks later, 
the uh, the oil rig had been attacked. I no longer had access to the clinic or the ambulance, and I was in a trench alongside the Pesh Merga with what medical kit I had in the pouch on my belt and nothing more. Yet the expectation was that I would still be able to deliver high quality emergency care. We also get mission creep. Perhaps you deploy as an emergency medic and you find yourself implementing sick call every morning or you need to provide healthcare training or preventative lectures or inspections and audits. Mission, the mission will change the geographical location will change, but the expectation will be we will always deliver a high quality of service. So be prepared for change. Think in advance, train for and visualize how you can respond to the same emergencies with limited resources. This slide is very similar. I deployed on a search and rescue operation or a helicopter search and rescue operation, having planned based on the information available, a plan A, B, and C. Once we're out in the field, the information changed, and therefore the plan had to change at short notice. It was a dynamic environment. We had a, a limited weather window. So I ended up rappelling or abseiling out of the helicopter into a canyon, down waterfalls, and then extracted the patient via a helicopter, a human external cargo operation, uh, which we trained for. We've planned in the past, but it wasn't part of our initial plan, but it was the only way to affect that search and rescue on that particular day. So ensure that you've got a broad skill set and you're current, competent and confident to undertake dynamic changes. These photographs don't even look like the same country, let alone the same week. The photograph on the left, the oil rig crew, we're receiving a five minute safety talk from the company man on the response to hydrogen sulfide gas being released on the oil rig. And then a week later, you can see my ambulance driver in the white vest uh, had just applied his t-shirt as an improvised bandage to the hand of a colleague who'd been shot by an ISIS terrorist. The roles changed, the equipment changed, the whole dynamic changed. Yet as an ambulance crew, we were still expected to provide emergency care. The photograph on the left, I was deployed as an oil rig paramedic responsible for the primary care clinic, daily sick call, training of site personnel, kitchen inspections, camp housekeeping, and the emergency ambulance. And then a local community leader presented to the clinic with dental pain. Um, I'm not a dentist. I hadn't previously been trained in expedition dental care. So I got on the satellite phone, spoke to my medical director and later a dentist and uh, turned my hand to field dentistry. In some circumstances, you'll be trained, but perhaps not experienced. And in other cases, you may have no training or experience, but you're the only healthcare provider and we need to fall back on a combination of adapted protocols, common sense and uh, more importantly, medical direction from a subject matter expert. Dynamic environments. They, these were in separate geographical regions, but both in the same country. On the left, I was a PSD medic or a close protection team medic. And on the right, in the same country, I was on my knees assessing a two month old baby for a, a pulmonary infection. Absolutely incredible. We train very, very specifically for operations, whether it be rescue, expedition, disaster, wilderness, or tactical. But as healthcare professionals, we need to keep a very broad perspective and continue our medical education as broadly as possible. You know, in that particular period, I trained to decompress tension pneumothoraces and uh, assess head injuries. And all of a sudden, I'm managing respiratory infection of a, a newborn virtually. So. Yeah, very interesting, very rewarding, but you need only fall back on your, on your training. So keep up the continuing education as broadly as possible because we do work in dynamic, dynamic environments and who knows what's going to come along.
That pause was intentional. The pause for thought, the pause for the victims. The image on the left is the base camp at Aconcagua, 6,964 meters. Well, the base camp's not at that altitude, the summit is. The base camp had heated tents, a kitchen tent, a medical tent, even shower tents. Similar facilities to the Everest base camp until it was completely obliterated by an avalanche following the earthquake in Nepal. The medics were expected to deal with the devastation and the mass casualty situation with only the equipment they had in their hands or their pockets at the time because everything else was destroyed. Where do we stop? Just like the second slide, it's very easy to take everything, including the kitchen sink. Where do we stop? Well, it should be tailored to the environment, tailored to the people, tailored to the activity, tailored to the findings and the risk control measures identified in your risk register. But if you're gonna be carrying it on a mountain or trudging through the jungle, then consider the equipment should be cut in half and cut in half again. Very easy for an urban provider to say, I would take this, I would take that. That's a luxury. That's the norm in a large ambulance, but it's not the norm when it needs to fit in your rucksack. So consider the concept of in half and in half again, and everything that you do carry should be multi-purpose, lightweight, robust, risk assessment based and practical. The large orange pelly case that you see strapped to the top of my rucksack there was not practical. It wasn't lightweight. It, I guess it wasn't really multi-purpose. Um, it actually contained portable ultrasound, a laptop-based ultrasound system. And I was carrying up the mountain just to test uh, as part of some trials we were conducting with our telemedicine system. Um, do we need to be carrying it? It depends. It depends on the incidence, it depends on the usefulness, it depends on how many patients, it depends if we're going to be carrying it ourselves, we're going to be based at a base camp. Um, so it really depends on your risk assessment. So continuing with the in half and in half again concept, consider if you're going to IV cannulate, do you need an IV constricting band or can you identify a vein with a latex glove or a nitrile glove? Do you need to carry a glucometer or can you identify hypoglycemia simply through signs, symptoms and a good history? Do you need to carry a pulse ox and spare batteries or can you identify hypoxia through signs, symptoms and color of skin? Should you carry a stethoscope or ultrasound? Can we extricate and immobilize a patient from a confined space with a rucksack, which will negate us carrying a large bulky single use item that is the Kendrick extrication device? Do we need to carry a stretcher or can we improvise a stretcher with a rope, roll mats, sleeping bags and duct tape? Do we need to carry splints, SAM splints, traction splints, inflatable splints, vacuum splints, or can we improvise that with belts, buckles, walking poles, clothing, and duct tape? All multi-use items that we're going to carry in the rucksack anyway. Would you like to manage the airway with a superglottic airway, a king, an LMA, or an IGEL? We need to carry the full spectrum of sizes for the group, plus if it was king, we'd need to carry syringes, lubricant, or would a nasopharyngeal airway suffice? It depends. It depends on your risk assessments, your currency, your competence, and your confidence with each item. So you've identified the equipment, the consumables, the diagnostics gear, the medications, the carrying platform or the package. Now, consider that it should all be protected from the environment. Dust, humidity, drops, falls, water, should all be labeled 
to enable you to identify and access the equipment as quickly as possible and to move through border checks as efficiently as possible. You should have an inventory, full inventory of everything you carry, including quantities, serial number, lot numbers, expiry dates, again, for customs purposes, and to enable you to identify any damages or deficiencies. Perhaps carrying it, everything in the original packaging is not feasible due to size and weight, but if it were feasible, it could reduce suspicion and could expedite your movement through checkpoints uh, and public places because it's very evident what you're carrying as opposed to things stuffed into a pouch in the bottom of your bag under a towel, which uh, could raise the eyebrows of a, an overzealous customs official. Supporting documentation for everything, for you, your credentials, your certifications, your insurance, for your medications, for your equipment, identify exactly what things are and what they're for, and that will just reduce the amount of stress you'll encounter. Are you able to carry everything on board the aircraft in your hand luggage, or does it need to go in the hold, or vice versa? You need to investigate. Where do you take sharps? Where do you take meds? Where do you take lithium batteries? And you should prepare a robust, tried and tested, written medical emergency response plan. Things will go wrong. The outcome will depend on your preparation. Irrespective of where you deploy, who with, or for how long, if you're responsible for the medical care of that person, person's group, then at each stage of the trip or the operation, you need to have a robust medical emergency response plan in writing. And it should highlight what could occur. What equipment do you need to mitigate the risks, manage the patients and treat them on site, on scene? How far away is definitive care? How far away is the hospital? How do you communicate with them? What facilities do they have? It's a dynamic document. You know, if the MRI machine worked yesterday, it doesn't necessarily mean it'll work tomorrow. If the X-ray machine doesn't work, where else can you go? If the hospital is adequate and does have appropriate facilities, are there staff there? Are they there in daylight hours only? Are they there during religious holidays? What if there's mass casualties? What if it's a multiple casualty incident? Can the hospital cope with various serious casualties? Or do we need to distribute them amongst various receiving facilities? What if the evacuation route is blocked through demonstration, landslide, floods, protests? Where do you go? Is there an alternate route? Is there an alter alternate hospital? Is there an alternate mode of transport? If not, and you have to batten down the hatches and care for the patient for a prolonged period of time, have you trained to provide prolonged field care to a critical patient? Do you have the equipment and the experience and the protocols? Do you have the ability to reach back to topside, to medical direction and get advice? It's all well and good calling for a helicopter, but do they fly on VFR, IFR? Have they got night vision goggles? Is there a heli point? Can they land? Is there a sufficient area safe enough and large enough for the helicopter to land? Can they fly in those weather conditions? Who's going to pay for it? Is the patient's insurance policy in date? Does it cover the full amount of the helicopter flight and the medical crew? If not... Do you have a plan A, B and C? Because either Mother Nature or Murphy's Law will strike. Guaranteed. And when you do create a medical emergency response plan, is it written down? Has it been tested through a tabletop exercise? Has it been communicated to the team so everybody knows how to implement the area that they're responsible for? And when it changes, does everybody know how to respond to the change? Is the plan updated? when the circumstances change. Issues that can affect the medical emergency response. 
Most should be 14. Quite often in our environment, things will occur that we least expected, but things that can interfere with your medical emergency response plan or the evacuation plan might include weather, landmines, anti-personnel mines, which can block the route, particularly if it rains and moves their location. Religious holidays. I remember trying to evacuate a patient in Kurdistan to the hospital because it was Ramadan, a religious holiday. Um, the hospital was closed. The Plan B hospital was closed. I got to the third hospital, which was open, but the senior consultant was on holiday. So you need to, you need to remember it's a dynamic environment. Call ahead, call ahead frequently, check out the facilities, check for any changes, and be prepared to respond to the changes. Roadside bombs, official or illegal checkpoints, floods, landslides, avalanches, fallen trees, comms failures, expired insurance. All of these things can at the very least add a delay to quality patient care or definitive care. So have a plan B. We've looked at very generic concepts which apply to virtually any rescue expedition disaster, wilderness, tactical, humanitarian operation. Uh, you can apply that to your own environment. We're just gonna look a little bit more specific now just to put all the theory into practice. We look at mountain medicine equipment or mountain medicine first aid kit. Given that we're going to be walking up the mountain at high altitude, weight, size is a factor. Mountain medical equipment should be practical, specific, lightweight, multi-purpose and robust. Taking a leaf out of the military's prolonged field care book then and using the minimum better best concept in a best case scenario on the side of a mountain you would have access to a cardiac monitor portable ultrasound ventilator laboratories um, hyperbaric chamber or gamoff bag that's really only feasible if you have a base camp so you can porter your equipment in store it there the big large heavy bulky items can be stored at the base camp if you're on a supported trek perhaps doing a siege style operation stocking higher camps or you've got porters guides yaks mules then perhaps you can carry a little bit extra medical equipment to the higher camps above base camp uh, you may want to take more diagnostic equipment some more supplies bvm oxygen cylinders but probably the minimum will be carried to the higher camps and the summit in your rucksack um, so that you can attend to medical emergencies, whether it be yourself or other participants. Minimum for prophylaxis or treatment of AMS, acute mountain sickness, would be acetazolamide or Diamox. Dexamethasone for HACE, nifedipine for HAPE, sunscreen, lip protector, oral rehydration salts, Elastic bandages for soft tissue injuries or splinting, duct tape to improvise everything, uh, whether it be repairs to the crampons, the rucksack, or even creating um, improvised goggles to prevent snow blindness. I put a CPR face shield in there. I don't think CPR at high altitude is feasible or it's going to be successful without a defibrillator, but a CPR face shield is smaller and lighter than a bag valve mask device and you may want to attempt CPR in certain circumstances, although the uh, success rate is not likely to be high. But there we are. The minimum that you should carry on a mountain is in the left-hand column. Uh, then better if you've got more weight or space in your rucksack or you can carry more weight or it's a team effort. And in the best, if you're supported by a base camp, then uh, you can stock that with additional medical equipment. So... Just a concept which you can apply to any operation. Now's a good time to pause the audio and go make a fresh coffee or a cup of tea. Um, we're going to look at 
a quick scenario. It is a specific scenario, but it could be applied equally to your own environment, to an environment where you aspire to travel to or where you're preparing to deploy to. In this case, you are an expedition medic, an advanced life support provider, supporting a trekking group in Mexico. The group, consisting of 22 participants between 16 and 54 years old, intend to attempt a multi-day trek through and camp in the pine forest around Pico de Orizaba, the glaciated peak that you can see in the background. The daily temperatures will be around 24 degrees Celsius. Minimum nighttime temperature will be zero. And the group aim to reach a maximum altitude of 3,800 meters. Follow on with the scenario, and this same concept can be applied to your environment. Consider what are the risks, the risks attributed by or exacerbated by the people, the participants in the group, the environment, pine forest, the high altitude, and the activity. Trekking, as you saw in the photograph, most had fairly heavy rucksacks or bergen. So consider the risk, the risk assessment process again. Consider the matrix, consider the risk register, consider people, the environment and the activity, and what are the hazards and risks and the level. Based on that, what are some of the risk control measures that you could implement to reduce that risk down to a tolerable level? And based on your risk control measures and the subsequent risks, what equipment would you like to take? Which supplies do you need? Which medications, communications? How would you carry it? How would you protect it? Now, hopefully you've decided how you would carry it and how you would protect it and what equipment you would need. Now ask yourself, is it practical? Is it comfortable? Does it cover all of your potential needs that you highlighted on the risk assessment? Is there any way that you can reduce the size or the weight of your pack without jeopardizing your capability as a medic? What are the risks if you do reduce the size of the kit and take out certain items? And what are the benefits of reducing the kit, the pack size and weight? It's just food for thought. There's no right or wrong answer, but your answers should be in line with your risk assessment. And the whole process from start to finish can be applied to any environment you deploy to in the rescue expedition and disaster sphere. It's a great process to start visualizing or discussing amongst your colleagues because the next time you deploy, um, it'll be your responsibility. Just to summarize then, medical kits are not medical kits. What you carry, how, how you carry it, where you carry it, will depend the word of the week the word of the red med sphere is it depends depends if you've got a, a whiteboard if you've got a, a jotter a notepad if you've got half an hour free 10 minutes free with a cup of coffee and colleagues at work sit down and create some scenarios whether it be deploying to Yemen on humanitarian operations deploying to Nepal on disaster relief operations Deploy into the Costa Rican jungle to support film crews. Um, deploy as the expedition medic to Kilimanjaro. Go through the process from start to finish. Throughout the whole of this presentation, think, where am I going? What are the risks based on the people, the activity, the environment? Complete the risk register, whether it be verbally or written. And think about what you need, how you can improvise, how you can take equipment that's multi-purpose lightweight, practical, and then 
can you get it into that country? Do some research. What can you take into Colombia? What can you take into Mexico? What can you take into Kenya, Nepal, Pakistan? Time spent in preparation is seldom wasted. And these visualization exercises will certainly serve you well next time you deploy, because what you take is what you can use. And you will be expected to meet the expectations of the trip leader, of the clients, of the injured parties or the displaced population.